In this video, we're looking at volumes by revolution. These are volumes that are formed when we revolve a region of area around a vertical or horizontal axis. And we can use integration to find, to, to measure these volumes using a couple of different methods. In this pair of functions that I've chosen, these are both invertible functions, which means we have an option of describing these curves as uh, what as equations where x is a function of y or where y is a function of x. So we're going to look at both possibilities using this picture. In this, in this picture I'm, I've shaded a region between a and b and this region is set up to revolve around the y-axis. And if it revolves around the y-axis, try to show that happening here, we're looking at it straight on. We're looking at um, we're looking at the xy plane uh, just straight on and it's not tilted at all to see any perspective and this makes it look like it's only going back and forth we don't see any forward and backward three-dimensional sort of motion so we can tilt this picture and that actually helps us if we tilt it we can perceive this a little differently we can see this sweeping around a shape and we can kind of start to imagine it being a volume. Now there's another convention used for volumes that you've seen before. If we look at a like a wireframe picture of the volume, we can see this area region passing around the y-axis. And it as it passes through space, it defines this volume. So we want to know how to find out the, the measurement of that volume. How, how much space does it take up? And there are a couple of different methods for that. To consider that volume, we need to, we need to look at what volume each piece of area is responsible for creating. And the area is divided up conveniently into little elements of area. And we, we can do this a couple of different ways. We could say that each y value has a piece of area, or we could say that each x value has a piece of area. And this won't always be supportive of both of these methods. Sometimes curves don't let you uh, describe them as, you know, you can't describe x as a function of y, or you can't describe y as a function of x, so you're limited to one of the two options. Um, as I said, in this case, we can see both. So I'll, I'll show you these, these uh, little pieces of area. And this is, this is what we would describe to integrate to find the area. If we wanted to know the area of this region, I'll just re replace this. If we wanted to find the area of this region, these are our curves right here. Uh, 2x to the fifth is the curve, uh, the polynomial fifth degree. 2x is the line that you see, and we could we could solve each of these for x as well. So uh, so we could use y to integrate the area, and if we did use y, then each y value would have one of these little tiny horizontal rectangles. So they have a long horizontal length, and their their vertical dimension is just dy. This other rectangle has a horizontal dimension of just dx, and its vertical dimension is the, the uh, distance between the curves, that height. So I've named the curves f of x for the quintic polynomial and g of x for the line. So this would be g of x minus f of x. That would describe the height of that line, and the width of that line would be dx. So we could we could use either of these to find the area. Now to find the volume, as it turns out, it's um, possible if we can describe how much volume this piece of area is responsible for creating. And this piece of area, as it sweeps around, um, I'm going to watch it sweep around. Again, I, I don't have any angle on this for the tilt. 
but as this sweeps around, I can see I can see the space that it passes through. And at that x value, and I'm only looking at the vertical line, when I say that x value, this vertical rectangle of area sweeps through space and it marks out a volume. And we can look at that volume. We could actually uh, trace, I'll just say display, trace the segment. And as I move through space, and look at all the places that this segment goes, it defines a volume of space that's a cylinder. And uh, likewise, the, if I decide to use Y and I chop up the area and, and look at how much area belongs to each Y value, then I'm looking at this little horizontal rectangle and I can watch this trace out the space that it occupies as well. And that makes a different shape. And those shapes are important in this problem. We have to understand how to find the measurement of those shapes and look at how we would um, envision this a little, a little better. This is not necessarily going to uh, construct the integral for us, but it's important to know what kind of region we're talking about. So I'm going to look at the volumes that are created by these little pieces of area. So these these are the little elements of volume I'm calling them. They, This is the amount of volume that goes with each y value. And if we look at all of those pieces of volume they would form a stack of disks that would equal the total volume of the, the shape we're, that we're talking about. If I look at the volume that belongs to each x value it forms this set of nested cylindrical shells and, and that's another way of forming the, the whole volume that we're talking about. So, so in this particular case, as I said, we, we have two options. And I want to show pictures of both of these sets. So if I look at the, the cylinders first, at each x value there's a cylinder that uh, goes with that x value. And we're only looking at a few of them here but you can kind of get the idea uh, what they each look like. So if we can describe what one of them has for its dimensions as far as uh, how the x value relates to its radius and what is the height of the cylinder in terms of x, then uh, we will know how to find the volume of this, of uh, the, the volume of a general one and then we can integrate that expression to find the volume of the whole solid. The other set of shapes are the washers. This, this washer, as it goes across all the y values on the interval, we see a whole stack of washers. And if again, if we can describe the washer at, uh, at a general y value, we'll just integrate that expression and that will add up the volumes of all the washers on the whole interval. Now these are these might be a little easier to look at if we if we tilt it a little bit we can see what these shapes are doing and then you see the cylinders are are just insignificantly thin uh, an individual cylinder has got really no no appreciable thickness to it. It's just that dx quantity. And uh, likewise, the washers over on the right have no real uh, thickness to them. That's just dy. So we're only looking at a few of each shape, but it gives you an idea of what the what the set does. So if, we're, if we want to work with x, um, we will need to use little vertical rectangles. And if those are revolved around a vertical axis, they make a cylinder. So if we choose to work with x, we'll need to work with cylinders. If we choose to work with y, the area that is at each y value forms a washer. So we would need to work with washers. And if you choose your shape first, if you say I want to work with cylinders uh, on, this, on this integral to find this, uh, this volume right here, if I want to work with cylinders, then I have to determine 
are the cylinders made by the vertical rectangles or by the horizontal rectangles. And, and that would change with the choice of your axis of revolution as well. So this axis of revolution is vertical, which means that the cylinders are formed when vertical rectangles are revolved around the axis, as we discussed. So the vertical rectangles go with the x values, so we'll have to use x if we want to use cylinders. And if we want to use washers, the washers are formed by a perpendicular segment, uh, rotating around a perpendicular axis, and in this case that would be a horizontal segment, and horizontal segments belong to y. So each y value has a horizontal segment, and it spins around and makes, out, makes a washer. Each x value has a vertical segment, it, it uh, spins around parallel to its axis, and it uh, defines a, a cylindrical shell. So this is a, kind of a neat picture that is available to you on the virtual math website. You can change the functions, but I've chosen functions that work out nicely because they define, uh, they're, they're defined by curves that are functions of x and functions of y. So, you, or rather, you could express x as a function of y or y as a function of x. One other thing that we could do with this is we could change the axis of revolution to something besides the y-axis. And if it wasn't the y-axis, if it was something uh, to the left, this would change the way we measure it. We would have to accommodate, we would have to account for that with the radius measurement. Because now the radius is not just the x value, if I'm talking about the, the cylinders. The, the radius of the cylinder is now the x value um, minus the x value of the of the axis of revolution. And when the axis was just at 0, then the x value minus 0 is just x. But now this is this is x minus, uh, let me put this back here at, at negative 1. This would be x minus negative 1. So the radius is now x plus 1, the x value plus 1. If we move the axis to the other side, of the region of area. Then we get a totally different looking volume and now the radius, uh, let's see, I'll get rid of that and I'll look at the shell. Um, looking at the shell, I have shells for each of these areas. My, my limits of integration will stay the same. But these shells have a radius that's defined by the distance between the axis of revolution and the little rectangle that spins around it. So this little rectangle here is located at x, and the axis is located at uh, something larger than, than the, the x value. So I'll say, well, I'll put it over here at 2. Then this radius is actually 2 minus x. And I need to write it that way because 2 is the larger of the two numbers. So 2 minus x would be the positive measurement of the radius. And we'll look at, look at these shapes here just just a moment. Um, as I move them around it's a little easier to perceive them as three-dimensional objects with the, with the movement. It's always difficult to portray a three-dimensional object in two dimensions. It's a projection of a shape that's pretty difficult to describe so we can benefit from the dynamic geometry environment here these are difficult shapes to draw, and when we draw them, we tend to not want to draw them over and over again, but this, this tool actually lets us mess around with the functions. We could, change, we could change the definitions of f and g. We can also change the interval that we're working with, and I just had gone for the, the bounded area, but I can change this to, to something less than the bounded area, and as, as I... Uh, well, I guess I can't. <laughs> this works for the shells, and in my sketch, I, I don't have the disks defined correctly. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Hopefully, it can be useful to you as you're trying to learn how to define these things and use calculus to find their volumes. Thanks for watching.